It only works when you turn it upside down. If you hold it like this, it doesn't work. I get to, uh, on Friday afternoon sometimes, I get to take my eight-month-old granddaughter upstairs for her nap. I could sit in that soft rocking chair. I get to hold her. I get to give her her bottle. But it only works when you turn it upside down. It doesn't work if you do it like this. She is, I mean, you may have cute grandkids. I'll give you that. Maybe as cute, but not cuter. She is so cute. Okay, can we get the pictures up? Oh, did we forget the pictures? Forgot the pictures. It, oh, thank you. I'll bring them next week. I'll be sure to remember that. Um, she's cute. But it only works when you turn it upside down. You know, that's a lot like the Christian life. We saw uh, in Acts some months ago where they said, these people, these Jesus followers, they've come into town and they've, they've turned the whole town upside down. But then we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and all of a sudden it's right side up again. And Paul has to say, uh-uh, 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 this isn't how it works. It doesn't work this way. You're supposed to, you're supposed to win by losing. You're supposed to love your enemies, right? You're supposed to give up your life to save it. It's why it's called, even in our society, the upside-down gospel. But we have to accept that, though. We have to accept that it is upside-down, and it only works when it's upside-down because God's way is always like upside-down from the world's culture. And the culture we live in is the world's culture. I mean, that's where we live. We live in the world. We live on this planet. We live with people in our culture. And their way of living is often upside down to what the gospel teaches, and it's so easy for us to join in that and to be right side up with the culture and crossways with the gospel of Jesus. We're gonna look at a passage this morning, Genesis chapter 22, if you grabbed a a sheet on the way in, it's on there, and if you didn't, it'll be up on the screen, but we see Abraham getting into this really upside down situation. In fact, critics of the Bible have looked at this passage and they've said, what kind of a God do you worship? What kind of a twisted, demented situation do you have going on in the teaching of your religion. And it's kind of easy to understand that until you actually look at the passage and compare it with other scripture and discover what the meaning of it is. It's easy on the surface to look at it and say, wow, this is, this is kind of crazy. But again, the gospel is upside down. It's not the way you conventional wisdom would have you think. So we're in this series called New, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. And this week, the title of the message is that death brings life. Death brings new life, new life. So God doesn't just forgive our sins, but he gives us righteousness. He doesn't just remove our debt, but he backfills it with riches. So death, the death of Jesus brings new life. So it's not just the removal of sin, it's the creation of new life. In um, Genesis 22, we see what at first blush looks like a bad father. So let's just get into the passage and we'll take a look at it. Sometime later, after Genesis 21, God tested Abraham. There's your first clue of what kind of a passage this is. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now we see later on in the passage there's a knife. He's not asking to just bleed him out, but he's saying burn him. A burnt offering is what I'm asking you to do with your son. Verse 3, early the next morning. So the next morning, in fact, early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, and I'm not sure what enough is, maybe he had to check Isaac's weight, figure out some kind of a ratio, but he cut enough, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. On the third day, he looks up, and he sees the place off in the distance, and he tells his servants, say, hey, stay here with the donkey. Well, I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. The two of them went on together. And Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, and these are maybe the two of the craziest verses in the Bible, Abraham, he built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it. So he likely would have stacked some stones and then he would have arranged the wood. And then it says, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. There's so much that the passage doesn't tell us. What did Isaac say? Did he fight him? Was Abraham crying? Was there fear? How old was Isaac? How big was he? Were there others there to help him tie him up? Seems like there wasn't. We don't know any of the answers. But he laid him on the altar and he laid him on top of the wood because the wood was gonna be what he lit the fire with. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Remember he answered, the Lord himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. We look at a passage like that, we're like, wow, God, what were you thinking? If every word of the Lord is important and true and wonderful, that doesn't seem like any of that was important or true or wonderful. God, why would you do that? And so I want us to look at three insights that 
help us to make sense of this passage. Number one, when we look at this, we see that Abraham trusted and believed God. We look back at Genesis chapter 15, and we see that Abraham believed God, and God credited to him righteousness because of that faith. And then in Genesis 18, we see where God is going to judge a group of people, and Abraham is wrestling with that, and he makes this statement, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And we see the beginning of the passage when God tells him what to do, he doesn't question. The next morning, he gets up early and he begins preparing to do exactly what God told him to do because Abraham trusted and believed God. And you get into the New Testament and over and over it talks about being a child of Abraham, being sons of Abraham. If we, like Abraham, believe faith, place our faith, our trust, our belief, all the same thing in this God of Abraham. Abraham trusted and believed God. That's the first insight to this story. The second one, number two, is that Abraham did not believe that Isaac would die. He didn't, and we see that in the passage, and then we see that in the New Testament. It says in Genesis 22, 5, that we're gonna go over there and worship, he tells his servants, and then we, me and the boy, are going to come back. Abraham believed that Isaac would come back with him. And then when Isaac asked him, where's the burnt offering? Where's the lamb? He tells him that God himself will provide a lamb. And then in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So the writer of Hebrews interprets Abraham's situation in Genesis 22 is that Abraham believed that God, even if Isaac were to be slain by his own father, that God could raise him from the dead. He didn't believe in the end that Isaac would end up as dead. And then number three, and probably the most important, is that we have to read this in a, in a prophetic context. It's a current story depicting a future event. This is what's happening now, and, and God is teaching this through this, not really fable, but through this life experience, and it's about something that would happen in the future. And God did this with Ezekiel uh, when he told him to cut his hair and cut his beard, and it was a picture of something that God was doing and was going to do with his people. He did it with Jeremiah when he told him to take the scroll and to eat it, and it would be bitter in his mouth. He also did it with Hosea when he told Hosea to marry a woman who would cheat on him and experience what it's like to be me, a people that go after other gods. And then to see the prophetic context, we look at Genesis 22 and we see how it actually, it looks ahead to Jesus. It looks ahead to Jesus. Sometimes when, and those of you who are old enough and have grandkids, even if you just have kids, you look at your kids and prophetically you see their future. You see what they're gonna look like in 20 years or 30 years. Or you look at your life and you know some of the things your kids are gonna live into. Or you're looking at a family and you see the kids that look just like the parents. And today they look like they're going to look in the future. Genesis 22, it looks ahead to the story of Jesus. Because both Isaac and Jesus are beloved sons born in miraculous ways. It's, it's just hard to miss. Both carry the wood intended for their death. And when you read it in Genesis 22, now 
hindsight is 2020, but you think about Jesus going to Golgotha, going to the, uh, the hill uh, where he would be crucified and how he had to carry the wood intended for his death. Both obediently follow the father up the mountain. Isaac asks a question. Where's the sacrifice? Jesus asked a question. If this cup could be taken from me, I, I, I'd really like it. Wondering if it could possibly be the will of the Father that he not drink from that cup, but it was not his will. And while Isaac receives a sacrificial substitute in the ram, Jesus actually is the sacrificial substitute. Jesus' death brings us new life. We see it in the life of Abraham right here. We see Abraham having to face this, this utter blackness in front of him. Imagine you at Abraham and Sarah's age finally having this kid that God promised. God promised. And then God asks you to kill the child. And you've got to go out and you travel and you've got the knife and you've got the fire to start the wood on fire. I don't know what that feels like. If, if he had already sacrificed animals, and indeed he would have by at that point, how do you put your kid in that spot? But what did Abraham decide to do? He decided to do what he had already done time and time before. He was just going to believe God. What is God calling us to do? What is God calling you to do? Not to sacrifice your kid, right? Maybe to share love with your neighbor. Maybe to forgive somebody who's wounded and offended you. Maybe to share money with somebody in need. Maybe to be kind to somebody at work or at school that nobody else is kind to. Maybe to go out of your way to put yourself into the life of somebody else. Maybe to reprioritize your life because today is different than it was 10 or 20 years ago and you don't really like the way your life is prioritized but you're kind of stuck in this loop and you're just doing the same thing day after day or week after week. And maybe God's saying to you, hey, hey, Take all this stuff and throw it all down and reprioritize your life. You're living for you. You're just doing what you want to do. You're not living for me. Because when we live for God, that looks like us living for others. That looks like us putting others ahead of ourselves. That looks like not what 1 Corinthians 11 describes, where when the people come to share in this love feast. Some are drunk and some are going hungry and some eat in the, in the outer area where the animals are and others eat in the special rooms and they just bring all the world's divisions and they bring it right in to their worship time together. That's not what God is calling us to do. Abraham had to face this outer blackness, this darkness, and he just stepped right into it. He, he moved right toward it, fully trusting that even though it was upside down, it didn't make any sense, it was opposite of what any sane person would think, he decided that he was going to do it. He was going to follow God, and God was going to work it out. I gotta ask myself, do I have that kind of faith? Do I have that kind of trust? A few times I've exhibited that. When my back's been up against the wall and I've been forced to make a choice, to make a decision, a few times I've made the right one. There's not been that many times in my life when my back's been completely against the wall. And we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have to get into a situation like Abraham for us to just believe God? Can it be the simple things, like talking to our neighbor, like sharing 
Christ with somebody, like sharing our resources with somebody, like committing some time in service to God and others? Does it have to be put your kid on the altar? Can it be something less? And God is asking us, even in those areas, to fully trust him, to believe him, to do the thing that he's calling us to do. I know that just looking through the room with all of you, God's calling you to do something for him. Have you been like Jonah who runs the other way? Or are you like Abraham who moves right into the heat of the battle, has no protection except for God, trusting that God is going to deliver. God is going to do what he wants to do and it's gonna be the right thing because the judge of all the earth will do right. Jesus' death brings us new life. The bread and juice we took today picture that loving substitute then who brings us new life today. Jesus' substitution on the cross for us brings us new life today. Next week we will eventually get to Romans chapter six and just to preview that it just says in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Christ's death makes us dead to sin but Christ's resurrection makes us alive. So don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies but offer yourselves to God like Abraham did, he offered himself to God, he offered his son to God. We've been telling stories through video of some of our people in our church. This morning I want you to see a story about Jamie Ruga who's been attending our church for several years and until recently, in just the last year or two, was a churchgoer and was trying to follow God but without that faith that Abraham talks about, without that faith that really ignites an ability in us to offer our mortal bodies to God and offer ourselves as sacrifices to God. And uh, Jamie's going to tell his story right now, so let's watch the screen. Nothing could fill that void that I was missing, and I was missing Jesus. And the doctor said that she shouldn't have survived, and here she is. I'm Jamie, and here's my story. I grew up in New Jersey. Grew up in a very uh, secluded church. Didn't have a lot of new people coming in, so it was a lot of the same faces, but it was easy to get lost in, in that environment. You know, you read of the 12 disciples in the, in the Bible, but I didn't know what a disciple was or what they did or how they were to disciple other, other people. I didn't have people discipling me. I come to realize the importance of being the example, setting the example, but then living out that example. I guess the first turning point was the summer I met my wife. I was not living the Christian lifestyle, and that summer I went to that camp, no expectations. And I, I'm helping my mom set up our campsite, and there's my wife just walking there. And I was like, that's, that's the one I'm gonna marry. You're the one. And looking back through all the things that I've been through, with my family, I'm 100% sure that God put Katie in my life for a reason. Another turning point in my life, uh, when, I, when my daughter Zoe got her accident. Um, looking back, and even afterward, after her accident, the doctor said that she shouldn't have survived. Here she is. That was God. 
shortly after that, um, my wife was in that pileup on Interstate 80. And there again, it's God, God showed his faithfulness to me. And I had no control of the situation he had to say this, but God's testing me here. He's calling me. I could have lost my I said, oh, I could have lost my entire family. And he saved them. He's real. He cares. And he loves me. And he doesn't want me to go through life alone. He wants to know my struggles, my sorrows. Me to rely on him. And most of all, he wants to have a relationship with me. Throughout all the years, I've been attempting to fill a void. My life was empty, in a sense, um, because Jesus wasn't in it. I had that relationship that I needed, that I was longing for, wasn't there, and there was this void that was, finally got so big, and everything else that I was trying to fill it got so small. That night, uh, yeah, I accepted him into my heart, I dedicated my life, I wanted to just live my life for him. I think of my walk in my life, my testimony, as uh, the parable of the lost sheep. I've been lost for all these years, and God has so faithfully pursued me, searched me out, and He found me in my deepest needs. Jamie said God was testing him, and it says in the passage we looked at today, that Abraham was being tested by God. Where is God testing you? Where does he want to see you take that next step toward him? Take that step even though you don't see where your foot's gonna land. I was talking to somebody recently who's kind of in that spot right now, that the only one they have to trust is God. And we were saying how, really, when would you not want to be in that spot? <laughs> Wouldn't you always want to be in the spot where the only one you can trust is God? There's something terrifyingly sweet about being in that spot where all your resources, whoosh, they're gone. Now you gotta, you gotta move your bucket underneath God's resources. Say, God, you fill it. I need you. you. My bucket is empty if you don't fill it. You're the only one that I can trust in. It's a terrifying and it's a wonderful place to be. And the times that I've been there, I've said to myself, I don't ever wanna move out away from this spot. But then God provides, and somehow we move ourselves over here and we say, look what I have. And then we begin to trust in our stuff. Where is God telling you and testing you? Where is God asking, hey, you come over here and you let me fill your life. You let me fill your life. You got nothing. You got nothing, but I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. It's gonna seem upside down, it's gonna seem weird, it's gonna seem like, God, why would you ask me to do this? But then it's amazing when we take that step of faith and we do what God's calling us to do and we see the change in our life and in others' lives. It's just a thought, but it's a good thought from Abraham, from Jamie, from others in Scripture that had to step out and trust God. Let's pray together. 
Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the story of Abraham. And now, Lord, we find ourselves in a spot of decision. Are we going to trust in our own resources, our own intelligence, our own strength, our own human wisdom? Or are we going to put our empty bucket in a spot where only you can deliver the goods into our lives. And God, help us to do the thing that you've been calling us to do, and we've been afraid. We've been fearful of what would happen. It doesn't make sense in our minds. God, for those here this morning who know exactly what that is, exactly that thing that you've been calling for them to do, but they've been running the other way. God, I pray that you would give them the courage, the courage to believe, the courage to trust, the courage to choose only you, only you, and trust you with the outcome. God, help us as a body of believers as we go out into our community this week. Help us to live for you, Lord Jesus. Help us to follow you. And help us, God, to make a difference in the lives of others as we do that. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.